I have spent all my life in Birmingham. Here, even the people are haunted. Sometimes I'm wondering what I'm doing with my life. Whether I should leave and get a new change of scenery, or stay and try to get my life back together. My parents died recently. They were on a plane to Italy on vacation. The plane crashed and everyone on board died. It wasn't pilot error like everyone in the media would like you to believe. Black box audio is usually public, but the audio for Birmingham Airlines Flight 1357 was never released and kept from the public. Of course, the theories came flooding in like water through a broken dam. Despite the best efforts of the government to sweep this under the rug, I and the families of everyone else who died on board demanded answers. We got none until the audio was leaked. That only brought up more unanswered questions. I listened to the audio myself. The pilots were just having an ordinary conversation. Then they both noticed something. The audio went dead silent, and the two pilots started confessing all their wrongdoings, everything they'd ever done spewed out of their mouths. The rest of the recording was just everyone screaming. I decided to move on and not dwell on any theories that other people on the internet came up with. It didn't really matter either way. My parents were dead. I had a uh, mock funeral. I was the only one who went. Seeing that we had no other family, it was up to me to get their house cleaned up and ready to sell. I wasn't looking forward to the probate process. One day I drove over there. The house was a poor facsimile of what it used to be. What was once a lush, well-kept lawn was now overgrown with yellow grass. Thankfully, the house and second garage across from it was made of brick. I feared to imagine what shape they'd be in if they hadn't been built with brick. Oh. As I walked up the pathway to the front door, memories flashed through my mind like lightning. Me and Dad tossing the ball when I was ten. Me walking the dog around the house with Mum when I was twelve. The memories faded and reality sunk in. I'd never be able to make memories with them again. I was over everything up until this point. Oh, my knees buckled and I dropped to the ground. Tears streamed down my face and I couldn't control it anymore. And they were gone forever, and nothing could change that. I took a few deep breaths and counted to ten. After my breathing exercises, I felt right as rain. I picked myself up off the floor and entered the house. It was eerie being in the house for the first time in years. The inside of the house didn't look abandoned. A part of me felt like Mum and Dad were still in their bedroom or living room. It was like being inside one of those houses in Chernobyl. Everything in the house looking the same as it did the day it was abandoned. Canned food and box food were still in the cabinets. Mouse droppings laid on the floor. The smell of mould and mildew was so strong I could almost taste it. I held my breath and trudged forward to the bedrooms to look for my parents' financial information. After a few minutes of rummaging through their bedroom, I found the paperwork. Also, well, I found something else. A box of letters that I'd never seen before, written by people I've never met. Letter 1 Dear Uncle Tony, November 14th, 1989 Happy birthday, Uncle Tony. Love is not something you can see. Love is something you can feel deep in your heart. And I love you. Love, Lorraine. Really strange. The letter is addressing my father, but he and my mother didn't have any siblings. Why lie? Did he have a falling out, and as a result he didn't want anything else to do with his family? Letter 2 Dear Uncle Tony, November 21st, 1989. I really like staying over and spending time with you and Aunt Pam. I love staying up past my bedtime to watch cartoons and eat chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> At night, it really scares me when I hear tapping on my window. I cover myself with my blanket and turn over. But the tapping just continues. Lorraine. Letter 3. Dear Uncle Tony, November 28th, 1989. I had lots of fun building snow forts with you and Aunt Pam last weekend. I had more fun when I caught the both of you by surprise and nailed you with snowballs. It was fun, 
until bedtime. The tapping started again, and this time I couldn't help but turn over, and I saw a monster at my window. I started feeling really guilty and sad as I stared at him. There was something mesmerizing about that thing at the window. Unable to look away, I started remembering all sorts of bad stuff I did, like breaking mom's vase and lying about it. I smashed my head against the whole pillow to make the thought stop. Lorraine. Letter 4 To Tony, December 4th, 1989 I'm happy to let Lorraine spend the weekend over your house. You're family after all, and I want her to know her aunt and uncle. You and Pam have really been there for Lorraine, and ever since Rick abandoned us a few years ago, well... You know. But Lorraine came home on Sunday with a bruise on her forehead. Please make sure you keep an eye on her when she's playing. Susan Letter 5 Dear Uncle Tony, December 8th, 1989 I'm really looking forward to spending Xmas with you. Thank you for buying me a Barbie. I love her so much. I played with her until that monster showed up. I saw him again and started feeling guilty like last time. And I remembered when I told a kid at school yellow snow was the same as a yellow snow cone and he ate it. I smashed my head again, and this time it really hurt. Lorraine. Letter 6 Dear Pam, December 18th, 1989 For whatever reason, Tony hasn't bothered to listen to me. I'm looking forward to having Xmas with you, but Lorraine got a bigger bruise on her forehead. How is she getting hurt so much? Susan. Letter 7 Dear Pam, January 1st, 1990. I really appreciate you and Tony having us over for the holidays, but there's something really odd that happened when I was there. I was awakened by a knock on my door. Lorraine was crying and telling me that someone was tapping on her window. I walked into the room she was staying in. At first, I thought there was something at the window, but chalked it up to my imagination since I was still half asleep. Clearly, I have not been listened to. I don't think I can allow her over your house if you continue not to listen. I'll allow you both one more chance. I don't want to have to do this, but if you force my hand, I'll do what I feel is best. Susan Letter 8 Dear Uncle Tony, January 4th, 1990 I really enjoy seeing you and Aunt Pam. I don't know if I want to come over anymore. I couldn't sleep last time. I'm really scared to go over. Lorraine. Letter 9. Dear Tony and Pam. January 7th, 1990. I cannot allow Lorraine at your house. When she got home from the last visit, she said she never wanted to go back and wouldn't stop crying. I don't know what happened, but... She's not going to your home anymore. I am furious that my rules were not obeyed. How dare you undermine me? I think you know how Lorraine got hurt too, but I'm starting to think it wasn't just an accident due to your negligence. Susan Letter 10 Dear Tony and Pam, February 1st, 1990 How dare you try and play the victim? You want me to reconsider? No way. If you guys didn't hurt Lorraine, then how come you can't at the very least admit that both of you are negligent caretakers? How dare you throw in my face all the things you did for Lorraine financially, emotionally, or otherwise. Don't try to spin me a sob story. Oh, Lorraine is the daughter I'll never have. Cry me a river. Also, never throw my condition in my face again. I've been just fine mentally, and I've been taking my medicine. My illness has nothing to do with the decision I'm making. I laughed when I read the part of your letter when you mentioned you were afraid for the child's well-being because I'm unwell. Don't ever threaten me. You'll never see Lorraine or me again as long as you live. It looked to be the end of the letters. I needed answers, so I searched the house for any more letters, but found nothing. 
I gave up. Feeling defeated, I gathered myself and grabbed the paperwork I needed and then headed home. During the ride home, I felt like something was following me. Well, I ascribed the feeling to just being on edge due to the letters. I pulled into the driveway of my home, feeling empty. My house was a mess. Not as bad as my parents' house, but still a mess. The lawn was unkempt. White peeling paint on the front porch and on either side of the house indicated that a new paint job was needed. It's not like it really mattered anyway. No one was going to come visit me. I was alone. The mailbox was overflowing with a thick stack of mail. I removed the mail, then headed inside. A few days' worth of dishes were piled in the sink. Also, the trash can was crammed full with fast food bags. Well, ever since the death of my parents, I've been barely taking care of myself. I threw my letters down on the table. Nothing but bills and junk mail. There was nothing to look forward to anymore. I dragged myself to bed and laid down. As my eyelids became heavier, I was about to drift off to sleep. I had the feeling that someone was watching me. I heard an ominous tapping on my window, but didn't dare turn over to see what was causing the noise. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>